After I finished watching Bloom Into You, I found myself constantly searching for more Yuri anime. Unfortunately, good Yuri shows seem to be few and far between, so I turned to my next best option, manga. Unlike with anime, there was a plethora of Yuri manga that had great characters and story, just like Bloom Into You. Bloom Into You was, of course, one of the first manga I read all the way through, and it remains to be my favorite manga series of all time. A lot of that has to do with the man himself, Nio Nakatani. His writing and art was like no other I had ever seen. He had a way of portraying the relationship of you and Toko under such unique circumstances and still make it one of the most realistic portrayals of love in media. With that being the case, it was only natural for me to be hesitant on picking up Bloom Into You regarding Saiki Sayaka once I saw that someone other than Nakatani was in charge of writing it. However, my doubts were nearly all but removed as I read Nakatani's note at the end of the first volume. To quote him, leaving the characters you created in someone else's care takes quite some courage, but when I heard that the person writing the spin-off would be Hitoma-san, I agreed without a moment's hesitation. And I definitely made the right choice. I couldn't agree more with what Nakatani said after reading both translated volumes of the series. I want to analyze some themes behind this wonderful series, particularly Saika's pursuit of love, but first, I'd like to take a little bit of time to just gush about why I love it so much. Let me start with when I fell in love with Hitoma Iruma's writing, and that was on the first line of the first page of the first volume. That line was, This may sound arrogant, but I knew early on that I was talented. My first thought after reading that sentence was, oh yeah, that's the Saika I know and love. After that, I read through the first half of the volume in one sitting. One type of character that I absolutely adore to see is the arrogant type. Specifically, well-written arrogant characters are my favorite. If an arrogant character is written poorly, all they appear to be is a punching bag for the reader to hate on. But if executed properly, the character can become a dynamic and naturally flawed character, making the overall story more interesting and engaging to the reader. Hitoma executed the illustration of Saika's arrogance flawlessly. For that reason alone, Hitoma has become one of my favorite authors of all time to read. Okay, that's enough gushing. Now, where was I? Alright, regarding Saika's pursuit of love. The Saika novels follow the slightly episodic journey of an arrogant and naive girl named Saiki Saika. Throughout her journey, Saika, whether she realized it or not, was pursuing love. To clarify, what she pursued was the one. She pursued her one true love, not just the feeling of love. Despite her persistence, most of her attempts, although valiant, miserably failed. Even so, her journey was not something entirely negative. It allowed her to slowly mature and learn about both empathy and her sexuality. Sayaka was a talented girl in grade school. She spread the focus of her talent throughout many different activities, in all of which she succeeded with flying colors. No one had surpassed her in any way, and she felt pride in that fact. Despite that, it irritated Sayaka when she saw people who didn't behave or give it their all to compete. There was one such person in Sayaka's swimming class, an unnamed girl who did not participate in any of the activities with the rest of the girls. Even with Sayaka's distaste for who that girl was, the girl still took a liking to Sayaka. In an attempt to make Saika more accepting of her, the girl actually began to take on a more serious attitude towards the swimming class. It turned out that she was actually far better at swimming than Saika was. Saika did not enjoy losing to the girl, but she didn't show her frustrations. The girl began to push herself more and more into Saika's life until Saika found the girl constantly on her mind. She was stepping into an unknown territory, and was afraid of what lied within that territory, so she kept her distance from the girl. Not once did she even refer to the girl by her name. Hitoma left the girl unnamed to emphasize the distance Saika placed between them. Even with that forced distance, it was still not enough to prevent Saika from gradually growing more fond of the girl. Her frustrations became less and less apparent, as she even began to somewhat adopt more of the laid-back attitude the girl had. When Saika jumped back into the pool with the girl, the girl took the opportunity to act on her feelings for Saika. The sudden change in the way the girl treated Saika made it apparent what her feelings really were. Saika feared the girl's feelings because it was something unfamiliar. Up until that point, the only human connections Saika thought she needed were ones where people placed her on a pedestal. She actively sought the attention of others through the pedestal she was placed on. The fact that the unnamed girl was better than Saika at something, and the fact that the girl was in love with her, showed her that not every relationship had to be on the basis of that pedestal. In other words, the girl made Saika's pedestal collapse and that terrified Sayaka. That pedestal had been the foundation of Sayaka's every ideal, action, and aspiration throughout all of her life. Suddenly, she had a whole new world opened up to her. That was part of the reason for Sayaka quitting swimming lessons and cutting the unnamed girl out of her life. The unknown that love was became slightly more known, but Sayaka was still apprehensive about abandoning her pedestal. 
Even so, the girls still ignited slight change within Saika and sparked her journey in the rest of the series. Deep down, Saika truly wanted to abandon her pedestal, but until she found something other than triumph to pursue, she had no reason to. The girl gave her that new something to pursue. Love. Saika's first complete experience with love did not occur until junior high. She had stopped taking swimming lessons, but she still actively pursued triumph, mostly out of habit. A girl in her grade named Yuzuki had the energetic and laid-back attitude reminiscent of the unnamed girl. Saika was not fond of the way Yuzuki acted, just like how she had originally felt towards the unnamed girl. However, over time, Saika came to tolerate and even embrace the way Yuzuki was. One day, Yuzuki confessed her love to Saika. Saika was unsure of how to feel about Yuzuki and took some time to think it over before replying. Saika's curiosity got the better of her and she decided to go out with Yuzuki so that she could come to love her. It was her first pursuit of love. As they spent more time together, Saika questioned more and more of what the feeling of love actually entailed. The more she questioned, the more she began to feel what love was within herself. She became attached to Yuzuki. Just as Saika was on the verge of grasping what love was and understanding her feelings, Yuzuki began to distance herself from Saika. Once Yuzuki moved on to high school, she believed that she needed to mature. She was pressured by the traditionalist values of her peers to believe that homosexuality was a childish phase. With that mindset, Yuzuki became even more naive and immature than she was before. To make it worse, instead of confronting Saika about it, Yuzuki instead attempted to simply push Saika away. Eventually, Yuzuki did confront Saika about it, stating, You and I aren't children anymore, so I don't think we should play at dating like this anymore. It's not good for us. Those words hurt Saika deeply. All that time, Saika had put in so much effort to come to love Yuzuki, thinking that Yuzuki actually loved her back. Yuzuki heartlessly threw all of that effort away with those two sentences. Yuzuki was a realization of a fear or insecurity that many people have in a relationship, the possibility of their significant other falling out of love with them. Despite that fear coming to fruition, Saika did not push away her homosexuality or her pursuit of love. She moved schools so that she could avoid the confrontation with Yuzuki, but unlike Yuzuki, she didn't believe that homosexuality and love were immature. To that end, Saika ended up being far more immature than Yuzuki ever had. Later in the series, Saika flaunted that fact towards Yuzuki when she ran into her at the train station. To no one's surprise, Yuzuki still had the same naive belief that love and homosexuality were immature. Saika lost some hope in her journey, yet she still remained determined in her pursuit of love. In both cases, I met someone, was thrown into chaos, and abruptly quit partway through. This time around, I wouldn't allow that to happen again. I silently hardened my heart as I attended the high school ceremony. When I saw her smiling face and profile, and how her black hair gently flowed in a way that made me forget the chill, three round white beacons of different sizes lit up in my mind. Despite Sayaka's efforts to never fall in love again after her experience with Yuzuki, she fell in love with Toko the moment she saw her. As Sayaka put it, but in that instant, all at once, none of it mattered anymore. She tried to force herself to avoid the feeling of love, but the persistence had already been deeply rooted within her, and she could no longer give up on the pursuit. Sayaka had finally fallen in love with someone without them falling for her first. She had a goal to chase with Toko. Throughout all of her first year of high school, she made attempts to get closer to Toko, but to no avail. Sayaka soon realized the disappointing truth that Toko was asexual after watching her turn down a confession of love. However, Saika also realized that there was something deeper within Toko, preventing her from feeling that way towards anyone. It became abundantly clear that Sayaka could not confess her feelings to Toko. At least, she couldn't until Toko had changed. Instead of trying to make that change in Toko in fear of ruining their relationship, Saika stood by Toko's side as a close friend. Toko placed a distance between herself and Saika. She did that with everyone, so that no one became close enough to see her true self. Saika respected that distance because that's all she could do. There was no room for her to break that distance. Unfortunately, that meant that she could never be close enough to properly confess her love for Toko. Instead, you took on that role. Originally, that aggravated Sayaka. She wanted to be the closest person to Toko, but eventually Sayaka realized that the only one capable of changing Toko was you. Through that, a friendship blossomed between the two. Sayaka was able to learn a lot from Yu's determination to change Toko as a person, and because of Yu's successful attempt to do so, Sayaka was given the opportunity to finally confess her love. It was the first time she had confessed to someone. 
Toko, of course, turned her down, because she loved you. However tragic her experience with Toko may have been, it was nowhere near as negative as her experience with Yuzuki. She learned so much from it, and even after being forced to accept that the one girl she'd ever truly loved was in love with another girl who reciprocated those feelings, Saika still remained persistent in her pursuit. She didn't give up hope after Toko. If anything, she had even more hope for the future than she ever had before. To top it all off, she developed an honest bond with you and Toko that could never be broken and would last with her forever. Sayaka's journey in her pursuit of love was a tragic one, but at last the light at the end of the tunnel was within Sayaka's reach after one fateful encounter. Saika met Haru in college under strange and awkward circumstances, and the second volume only briefly touched on their blossoming relationship. Saika met Haru in the middle of crying, completely without context. After that interaction, Saika noticed that Haru was in the same class as her. Haru chose to sit next to Saika, which was the start of a new opportunity for her, even if she was unaware that that was the case. Haru was somewhat similar to the unnamed girl in Yuzuki, in that she seemed somewhat energetic and laid back. Unlike Yuzuki and the unnamed girl, however, it was clear that Haru had something darker hidden beneath the surface. She was also unlike the two other girls in that she was far more awkward and understanding of interpersonal distance. She wasn't pushy towards Saika in any way. Hitoma wrote Haru in this way on purpose. He contrasted Haru from Yuzuki and the unnamed girl to allude to the fact that Haru is the one. Haru is similar to both the unnamed girl and Yuzuki to show that she will be Saika's next encounter with love, but she is also different from the two girls so that her importance isn't undermined. The differences are emphasized to say, this is the one. Even if the light at the end of the tunnel is within view, Saika still has a very long way to go. I'm excited to see her get the happy ending she deserves in the third volume once it's translated. Judging by the art I've seen so far, it looks a lot like Sayaka will be getting that happy ending, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> Hashtag Haru top. I have no doubt that she will still have hardships, but after all she's been through already, I know that she can still make it through and reach the other end of the tunnel. In the end, pursuing love worked for Sayaka. After repeatedly facing adversity and pain, she got back up and kept going. Her persistence, hard work, and determination were the key factors in her success. Just because the active pursuit of love worked for Sayaka does not mean it would work for everyone. For one, the pursuit of love can easily derail into a spiral of desperation, which can be dangerous. Even if Sayaka was persistent, she never desperately pursued love just for that feeling. She pursued it for the person she loved or wanted to love in each scenario. Another possible consequence of pursuing love is that it can become very discouraging. Sayaka experienced that discouragement after Yuzuki. Instead of giving up entirely after Toko, she actually became even more motivated. Her friendship with both Yu and Toko allowed her to move on and stay persistent. Sayaka may have felt discouraged at times, but she never let that consume her. There are many methods of finding love. The most common stems from the quote, love is like a butterfly. If you chase it, it will elude you. However, if you stand still, it will come and calmly rest on your shoulder. The Saika novels focus more on the pursuit of love and how it will not always elude someone pursuing it. Saika is the perfect example that love can be pursued and still be found in that pursuit without waiting around for it to come. Bloom into you regarding Saiki Saika is certainly a unique perspective on love. All the more impressive is the fact that it's executed nearly flawlessly with Hitoma's fantastic writing. Hitoma's imagery and descriptions of Saika's thoughts really added a lot of depth to the themes of the novels. Even the actions and behaviors of the other characters were well written to show their personalities and motives. The novels are masterful pieces of literature that show Saika as a character in a whole new light, while also covering unique themes of love that stand out from the parent series. I strongly recommend you read them if you like Bloomin' to you and you haven't read them already. If you stuck around for the whole video, thank you. It's sometimes difficult to fit in the time to do these longer essays, but I'd still like to do more. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more essays around this length. Also, let me know what you thought of me covering a light novel series. I love the Sayaka novels so much, if it wasn't obvious already, and they fit perfectly into my Talks of Love series, so I knew I had to cover them. I want to possibly cover some other manga or light novel series, so tell me if you'd like to see more of that. Thank you all for watching.